Before you start listening to this podcast episode, I want to tell everybody that I finally had the result of my exam and I am now officially a licensed tour guide by the Palestinian Ministry of Tourism. And I would like to remind you that together with my colleague Salim, we are organizing three 10-day programs this year to discover Palestine. There is still space for the upcoming program mid-March and also in June and October. We will travel around the West Bank, Jerusalem and Jaffa with small groups, maximum 10 people. And we will provide you with a historical background. We will introduce you to the Palestinian heritage and, of course, to the geopolitical reality. We'll make sure that you get to meet a lot of locals. We will stay in family-run hotels and also spend two nights with local Palestinian families. There will be some short hikes. And during the October program, you can also join a day of olive harvesting. So if you are interested, then check out our website for more information. I will add the link in the show notes. You are listening to Stories from Palestine podcast, a bi-weekly podcast recorded in Palestine and about Palestine. My name is Crystal. I studied history and tour guiding, and I live in Palestine with my Palestinian husband and children. I'm originally from the Netherlands. I am a licensed tour guide by the Palestinian Authority. And yes, you can hire me for tours. Follow me on social media and visit my website to learn more about organized tours and programs. You can find the links in the show notes. I hope you will enjoy listening to this episode. So recently I got a lot of requests from people asking me about environmental issues in Palestine. I guess it has something to do with the fact that we all know uh, more and more about global warming, more and more about the effects of that on nature. And also people are aware that in Palestine there is already a lot of problems that people have to deal with, but then that the global warming and the environmental issues are part of everything that's happening in the universe at the moment. So I said, okay, let me find the best person to talk about this issue. So I'm here sitting with Mohamed Saleh. You are from the north of Palestine and you have your own company that does a lot of work related to the environment, to ecology, uh, to the nature. Maybe first you introduce yourself, who you are, how did you come to what you do now? And then we'll talk more about what you do and about nature, environment, all those issues here in Palestine. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning. So as you said, I come from the north. I created in 2015 a social enterprise called Mustadam. Mustadam means sustainable in Arabic, a word that was a bit uh, foreign to me. And I thought about it in the shower <laughs> while thinking about an Arabic word for sustainable because I didn't want to use any foreign uh, words. And I found it really beautiful. And then I checked the dictionary and fa I found out that this is a real word, uh, like the way I thought about it in Arabic. And then I started doing things for my own. And that started to spread, you know, it was a hobby. It was just a passion. And I will tell you the history behind that. And then it started to spread through uh, photos, friends and so on. And now seven years later, I'm uh, full time managing this initiative. Maybe you can call it company on the on the registered level. And that all that started not because I had a background in this in any way. So I was uh, born in the 80s to a family of refugees that came from uh, Tiberias and they adapted the life of uh, academy so uh, of studying and uh, you know not anything related to the land or uh, farming in any sense I remember the only time I saw a gardening activity in my in my whole life with my family was my grandfather weeding once. <laughs> 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 so nothing. So people, when I stand in, in front of people today and talk about all this, I tell them until 28 years old, I knew nothing, wow. absolutely nothing. A seed of love to nature and longing started somewhere 
around 2009, a year or two after I got married and lived here in Jerusalem. Out of nowhere, I don't remember what what triggered it. And I started writing songs about wanting to live in the nature. It started with one that says, I want money to live without money. Because I was thinking how I can live on the land. And land here in Palestine is super expensive. Slash yani Israel and Palestine. Super expensive, not easy to get permissions and all that. And if I want to travel and buy somewhere else, it also costs money and so on. And then one song after that, they, they had the type of uh, hip hop kind of by then. One song after that was Wilderness, Wilderness, Wilderness. I just want to live in the wilderness. And right after that, Shirin, my partner, got a scholarship in Turkey. And I contacted a Turkish friend and she sent me somewhere which is living off the grid in the nature. And that's where all this, uh, the story started in 2010. But maybe I already expanded your, your question, so I will leave it to you now. Well, I was always wondering, how did you guys end up in Turkey? <laughs> now I know it was because of Shirin. But what was it that you were doing there in Turkey? Because I remember you told me that this is the place where you learned to live in nature, right? Yeah, absolutely. I was uh, looking, uh, you know, to do something while Shirin is studying. I wasn't able to get the scholarship. So I was sent to this place, which is, if you if you know where Istanbul is and then where Izmir is, in the middle, there is an, a district called Çanakkale in Turkey, which is like on the Mediterra Mediterranean Sea, looking towards Lesbos, the Greek island. And this friend recommended me to go and visit these people. I contacted them. It was, by the way, really far from Shireen. I wanted something close to, to to her so we can come and go and so on. It was 17 hours in the bus. So I was like, I'm not sure about that. But anyway, I will spend there a month and we will see. So I contacted the people and they sent me a website where I paid 30 euros for a subscription of one year. And through that, I was able to become their volunteer, which later I learned that I was a woofer. Ah, oh, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so woofing Turkey. I was, I paid for woof Turkey, which is called Tatuta. I'm not sure what it's called now. Tatuta, which is Tarim Tourism Takas, which is agriculture tourism in an ecological way. And then exchange, barter. And why I was recommended to go there is really important, by the way especially here uh, sitting in Bethlehem, the guy that inspired this place I went to, which was kind of a school called Life School or something like that. He's called Victor Ananias, but actually he is called Victor Hanania. He comes from a Palestinian origin, wasn't born in Palestine. His father is Palestinian that uh, migrated to Chile, I think a religious uh, migration, married to a Turkish uh, lady. And when she was pregnant with Victor Ananias, the kid, the junior, the doctors told her to make abortion because the kid will die and the mother will be in danger. What they did as a family, the father, Victor Ananias, the father, he took his partner and went to live in the nature completely natural. And they started as a job to operate, like in Holland, the windmill, the real windmill with the fans, you know. Turkish people are famous for this and we can see it in Jerusalem, the windmill they had in the Turkish quarter, which is outside of the old city of Jerusalem. They call it now the Garden of the Bell. So they operated that, they lived off the nature, I think they were vegans, and the kid was born, the mother stayed alive, I met her when she was like really old lady until 2015, she was still alive, now I missed a bit the news, and the kid lived 40 years, okay, and he, he's called in Turkey as a change maker, because he brought ecology hardcore to Turkey. And he created this place where I lived. It was an off-the-grid ecological school where we lived off the land in every sense. And that to me was extraordinary. As a city boy, I would call myself by then, that was revolutionary. The, the things I got exposed to, the people and the knowledge in such a place. And that's what I try to transmit in my lectures mm -hmm. here. 
So you spent there a certain amount of time and then you had to decide, of course, at some point to leave Turkey and to come back to Palestine. You had all this new knowledge and maybe this new passion mm. and then you wanted to do something here. But then you are also confronted with different reality. I mean, Turkey is eventually, it's a free country and Palestinians, they are living here under a colonial rule and under oppression. So how did you manage to take what you learned there to implement it here? And what were the challenges that you found there? So I stayed five years, which was profound in the amount of knowledge I was able to get exposed to. I think it was a transformation in every sense. After three months, I was uh, asked to be the manager of this place, which was running courses from composting to quantum physics, all the way th through homeopathy, yoga, uh, sky watching, animal language. So it was like for somebody who was stuck to the computer and the screen before that, that was like mind blowing. And there I was exposed to things that, that I was able to, to give me tools to bring to Palestine. The first thing I hated, by the way, books and schools in my past. This yeah. Education is not for me. Yeah. My father is a big reader. I didn't read. Oh, yeah. But then there I started reading intensively. Started with the One Straw Revolution by Masanobu Fukuoka from Japan. It's like farming, but with a lot of philosophy practical farming with a lot of philosophy behind on how this universe works. From there, I moved to permaculture, and that's my, my profession now, my degree and the degree that I provide to my students, because Masanobu Fukuoka talks to the big decision makers and farmers in this world, and I wasn't. And I, I needed a little bit of information to, to help me start gardening, saving water, dealing with, uh, with little, little issues, just understanding the basics. And permaculture, when I Google it, when I Google the question of how to, let's say, feed the soil without putting the word permaculture, I will have some conventional farming or gardening. But when I put after my questions the word permaculture, I get what I want, mm. which is things that are friendly to nature, friendly to every kind of life, and is sustainable and regenerative in the way we manage things. Permaculture means permanent culture. And it was uh, established in the 70s as a, a designing or planning system to help you plan whatever you want to do in this world without harming anything and also not to suffer. So we don't want to live in a bad way. Taking this information to Palestine was in my head for two years. I want this to be adaptive to my country, to my climate and to my people. So I started thinking where I start with this. Okay, maybe somebody you know in in Europe will talk about it like that. In Japan as well, they have a lot of humidity. But here we have the issue of eight and nine months of drought. For two weeks of drought in Holland or in Europe, it's like a big deal. Here we have eight, nine months. So I started by looking into is this applicable for our country? And I started finding in Google permaculture books that deals with the lack of water. And I found a scholar who's amazing from Arizona. And Arizona is way harder than Jericho, which is like really dry desert. And he was able to create food forests in the sidewalk. And that gave me a lot of hope. And what he learned, he learned in Africa by a farmer that was not allowed to work by the government. So we're talking about, you know, hard situations that corresponds to the reality here. And that gave me hope. Two huge books that you can see here called Water Harvesting for Dry Lands and Beyond, Volume 1 and 2. So that and other things by by other people, uh, you know, that, that talks about farming in, in dry lands and so on. So that as a knowledge set me up in a nice way for coming back, but I also didn't know what would people expect here, what they want, would they welcome such a thing and so on. And, you know, I can tell you now, seven years later, they welcome it absolutely. They're ready for it. And actually, one of the things that made me think 
they're not ready for new things. They had all of this. Was a movie that I watched as soon as I came back in Yabus Cinema in Jerusalem. It's called Wanted 18, which is a documentary about sustainability and resistance in Beit Sahur in the First Intifada which talks about self-sufficiency, you know, with the decision of the community. This movie tells the story of, you know, growing your own food, which is called Victory Gardens, Hadaiq al-Nasr, which is a concept that was also in the World War in Europe. And about, you need to watch the movie, whoever uh, listening, about uh, buying cows from a kibbutz and then breeding these cows and having your own milk and not needing the milk imported from the outside. Which if we zip 30 years later, we are in complete opposite. Nuva and the Israeli companies' milk is all over the West Bank now. And the dealers of these milks are part of the West Bank. <laughs> but, you know, this is, things are roller coaster and everything in life. But anyway, I found out that this concept of self-sufficiency, growing your own, creating local economy, growing it together and so on, is something that is there embedded in the history, in the minds, maybe not of third and generation and beyond, but the first and second generation are completely used to that. What is in third generation and beyond is the longing for nature. When you talk about third generation, you mean since the 1948, since the Nakba? Yeah, since the Nakba, absolutely. So I am third generation. I consider myself that at least, you know, there is my grandfather who passed the Nakba uh, directly. There's my father who was born like 10 years or so later. And then there is my generation who was born later on. And a lot of us are not exposed to farming are not exposed to gardening, to relation to nature, to self-sufficiency. Me, as somebody who was born in the 80s, nothing. Nothing, nothing. I know nothing. I know the trees of my father's grandmother that I ate so much from, and now they're all gone, but she grew them. Her children and grandchildren didn't grow any. And it's also the case for the refugee camps. I'm not a refugee from refugee camp, but if you think about refugee camp kids who maybe resist with stones and so on, they go back and what they eat is food produced mostly in Israel or imported. So this is something important to think about. And all of us think about how to to have a better life in Palestine and how to decide and how to be powerful. And for me, This path was absolutely a thing. I wasn't able to be a politician or anything that is related to the mainstream solutions they take here. For me, it was a double solution of let's also save, we don't save nature, by the way, but let's also be kind to nature and uh, delete our impact, our bad impact on it, and also be powerful by putting hand in hand with nature, who is the main and the only producer of everything we use in life, from clothes to food to building to computers to mobiles to everything we use is produced by nature, from materials in nature. So let's put hand in hand with the main producer so we are producers as well of our own uh, reality Mm. uh, and needs. So I think, I don't know if I I, I skipped your (laughs) answer. While you were talking, I was just realizing that whenever you walk around here, especially in the West Bank, there is not a lot of, it seems that there is not a lot of uh, land available anymore to Palestinians to farm. We know that a lot of people who own land, they can't reach it or they are not allowed to dig water wells. They are not allowed to build roads or even a shade because it's all under Israeli military rule. So there you have one challenge that I would like you to maybe talk about. And also, when I drive through the West Bank and I pass through that area C, we call it it, under Israeli military control, but it's Palestinian agricultural land, we see so much trash. I hadn't driven to Jenin for like 10 years, and then I had to go there a few months ago, and I was so shocked to see on how much waste 
and trash and car tires and plastic we see around here. So this is always when people visit Palestine, one of the things that they notice and that they have questions about. And I always try to come up with some answers on why is that and how can you deal with that? I wouldn't consider myself, you know, like uh, well researched to tell you exactly why these are th things are happening. But my first intuitive thought is this is uh, because of the lack of right management. I don't want to put bad words on it because I'm not into putting any responsibility on others. I really like to, to think we're all responsible all together. There is something in the infrastructure and the management needs to change. And I don't believe in putting that on the lack of money or the lack of freedom that we, we, we have as a fact in, in, a, in a country surrounded by a border controlled, not by us and not by its own people. But my approach to this is there is always a solution to every problem. As a grassroots person, and I, I worked for uh, the last big chunk of my profession with this alone from digging the land and recycling the recycle and collecting the things from the garbage and doing the 3d design and sanding and uh, dealing with tools and everything because i wanted to be a doer before a talker because here in this country everybody can talk but actually actually we have big brains and that's that's normal for anybody occupied who ha doesn't have other power except for intellects this is something that you can find in psychology where intellect is the power of the oppressed so i don't say anything bad about that but looking at my father and his uh, big brain brothers as well talking things all my childhood i decided doing is the way And then talking about what you did is okay. My thought is every one of us needs to have idea about this and the ones who can actually bring it to implementation, go for it without needing governmental permissions. I was sitting in a, in a meeting with a lot of uh, initiatives, ecological initi initiatives here in Palestine, and I found myself the only one to be doing something that doesn't need governmental permissions. And suddenly, the person who was facilitating this meeting, he said, ah, you don't have problems. <laughs> <laughs> I realized, uh, 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 I, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, so, so that's, that's, that's a plus I want to pass to others. Uh, let's look at it, research it and find a solution that doesn't need a lot of bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. My way was to find garbage and do from it things related to gardening. Mm -hmm. My other colleague, he recycles and does jewelry and other stuff with it. But I wanted to always deal with things related to the garden and plants. Mm -hmm. And you can do a lot. And in Arabic, actually, the word muhmalat, which I also learned from my friend, the word muhmalat, which means waste, but it doesn't. It means neglected. Okay, so the root of the word waste in Arabic means neglected, which means if you neglect it, it become waste. So everything that is surrounds us in the street We are only a neglecting a resource that if we use, becomes a resource. If I could clone myself and multiply myself, I would be dealing with all these and solving them with all the thoughts possible. But I realized I'm one person and I can do very little. So I'm doing what I can do. But I have big hopes in, in a lot of beautiful minds here in this country who can take a good idea and uh, bring it on. And suddenly you will find a lot of people wanting to do exactly the same like you. You know, with tires or with whatever, you know, like this lady, in, by the way, as an example, and I finish with that, a lady in Gaza took rubble and grinded it, smashed it. And from that created bricks. And with these bricks, they're creating new houses. Mm. So it's not like the problem is uh, the problem in the first place that we shouldn't have rubble and we shouldn't have anybody smashing your houses or controlling your destiny. But If you have, until you solve that, you try to make the best of, of your situation and still work on solving this problem in the first place. I'm not saying anything about not solving the issue, but 
Meanwhile, we try to be creative with dealing with the issue in new ways. Mm. So this is this is the kind of people I I am sure we have, and we need to see more of. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about a few of the projects that you have been working on? Because you do different things. Mm. If somebody approaches you and says, "I have a big garden and I don't know how to to deal with it. I want to have a sustainable garden where I don't need to use too much water and I want native plants that grow here and not something imported," you can do that. But you also do a lot of other things, right? Yeah. Through the years, I was asked to do a lot of things. And I would say that uh, now I can kind of, if we want to be funny, define myself as the green genie, <laughs> uh, you know, as, as one of the first pioneers of working with sustainability and ecology. Not that I was the first in any sense, but, uh, you know, one of the people who took it seriously and put full time in it. So I was asked to do a very big spectrum of things mm -hmm. and still new things can come up. I deal mainly at the moment working with schools and kindergartens in East Jerusalem. I mean, on two dimensions, teaching, short term and long term with groups and implementing. So hand in hand together. So I teach a lot. It's, uh, every week I have a few lectures here and there. Sometimes it's uh, like lately I'm teaching in Imtuba under the mosque for a group of ladies uh, on uh, Tuesday to old ladies and uh, on Wednesday to young ladies. You know, we're talking about all kinds of things. Yesterday I was teaching them about composting and compostees, something that they're not familiar with, but it's super simple. We showed them, uh, you take this, nah, 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 nah. with a few tens of shekels, you can make this spray it on your plant, solve this and that problem, and so on. And Imtuba is a, is a village in its sense. I would say it's one of the, the network of uh, food growers for Jerusalem, the city in the center, you know, from Batir to Imtuba and to this and that. So uh, they are farmers in every sense, but they have new questions. Some knowledge is disappearing. So there's that, the teaching. I teach also to, to school kids from three years old to 17, all kind of stuff with, with the kids in the kindergarten is always fun. It's like a, you know, theater I make with them. We take it, make a train. We walk together. We talk about this and that. We clap our hands to clean them from soil because, you know, Touching soil is not so familiar for these kids and we make it fun, you know, we touch it, but we, we are not bothered by it. So we clap for ourselves because we became the urban farmers and stuff like that. So you adapt it. And if I go back to your first question, I don't say permaculture and I don't say all these concepts. I try to, to talk to anybody that I encounter from the ground they are on. And we always need to do that. I mean, any colleague that or any future colleague that is listening to this, we always need to be on the level of the people and even lower. We always give them the credit and we are trustful that they know and they have something really beautiful that they know. And not only about farming, about something, you know, maybe they can make a song, hip hop song about nature, anything that is creative that can bring the society closer to this kind of living or philosophy. So uh, I do this uh, at the moment, for example, we are doing placemaking, which is called in, in the public spaces also in East Jerusalem in collaboration with schools. So we go, we go to a school, we talk to them, we go outside of the school, we found uh, some uh, abandoned place and we try to see what kind of ideas they have there. We guide them in this process and then we implement it for them, the decision they made. So we're doing in two places now seats from cable drums. You know, the cable drum is a round wood that you find in the electrical company. We open it in the middle and we plant a tree in the middle. So you sit under a tree on this recycled bench which we also oil with natural oil and we try to use recycling in as much as possible even for the legs of this bench and we do it with the with the school girls in this case 
and then they have shade even for the community to sit by and so on and so on so yeah and uh, last year we worked with a very old ancient fig tree in Isawiyi they decided to make some kind of seating so we took all the old branches around and we make seats from them and we organized it in this sense and so you're you're doing much more than just permaculture yeah. You sound like you're almost a sort of a carpenter, upcycler. Mm. Hey, and uh, I mm. think that you've also been involved in something that happened in the refugee camps where people usually came from villages. Mm. In 1948, these villages were attacked by Zionist militias. The people had to flee their homes mm. and then they were forcibly displaced. They ended up in refugee camps and they were farmers. Mm. They wanted to mm. plant and to grow and there was little space there to do that. But these days, there is a new initiative that people do in the camps, right? Yeah. By me and by others, uh, there was a lot of initiatives of working in the camps, uh, bringing this green touch to the camp. Some projects worked on implementing uh, greenhouses on top of roofs and uh, planting in there. I started with this in 2016 in Colombia International, the Art Binali in Palestine. It was an art project in Ramallah trying to implement recycled models of gardens that you can do in the camps with the waste that you can see in the camps to solve problems that you find in the camps and grow your own food. I call the project Yalikum. Yalikum is a, is a word that comes from uh, a sentence in the Islamic culture that says, Kulu mimma yalikum, which means eat from what's close to you, from what nearby to you. Some people think, you know, when you sit on a table, eat from the things close to you in the sense of uh, that is table. So, but I, I heard the sentence with my, you know, uh, permaculture glasses as if eat local. So I called this uh, Yalikum and uh, there were seven models. Uh, one is rooftop gardening, vertical gardens, aquaponics garden, which means uh, gardens without soil, beekeeping on the roofs and using grey water from the sink and the, the shower and so on. Number six is uh, food foresting in very small spots, like in two by two meters, if you have soil and so on. Even in a pot, it's possible. And number seven, number seven, I can't, <laughs> I forgot, it's, it's already six years. So there is that. And the other thing I need near a refugee camp, uh, but with the kids there, was working on urban farms. That was in 2009, uh, 19. And that's a concept of we have cities and we have refugee camps and we have still very small spaces that we can use for farming, like profitable farming. This land was 10th of a dunum, which means 10 by 10. And we were able to grow a bit a bit more, I think maybe 15 by 10. And we were able to grow 1,000 plants in this spot in the middle of Beit Lahem, near Aida camp. Which means if you manage it well with some few concepts of ecology and uh, business management with a Facebook page called uh, the farm of Imali or whatever, selling to your customers directly, not to the Hisbi, not to the whole market or the vegetable guy, then you can make profitable farming locally without fuel and feed yourself and the local community around, which is very important, I think. Mm. I actually want to visualize what you do and maybe you can explain us if you had a plot of land and you wanted to plant it and you, I want you to mention some local plants. I mean, we have Palestinian listeners who are living abroad and we also have foreigners who don't know anything about Palestine. What are the typical native things that grow well here and how is it also by season because you have like every part of the world will have different seasons when things grow how many crops can you harvest here when do you plant what like give us like a practical example i have my garden it's empty i'm asking muhammad muhammad come give me a plan what am I, what are we gonna do wow this is wild you know thinking about it in terms of my own land means 
I can use all the knowledge I accumula accumulated. This is the dream, by the way. My dream is to be again living like I lived on, in Turkey, on a land, and especially to have this as a living example for whoever want to visit and see what's possible. So it will be different if you ask the question if I do it for somebody else because because I have to consider their own knowledge when I plan for them. If we start thinking about the names of uh, of wild plants that we can use to grow something local, buckley is the first one that comes to my mind, which has so many names in Palestine, like everything, which means farfahina and this and that. And by the way, this is the favorite food of Gandhi. Yeah, purslane in English. It's full full of nutrition it grows wild almost everywhere in the world so if we're talking about local now we're talking about local universally except for ice places like you know and it's buckley is is amazing you pick it in the spring you uh, you roast it with uh, some onion uh, you know garlic lemon and, and it's so so healthy and tasty even for kids i let khobezi and uh, akub and you know the list is long these things maybe if they are not in your land already you can introduce them this is the beautiful thing now i can find even the seeds of these wild plants to able to harvest and grow my own even wild za'atar which you can find now here in al makhrur if you go for a hike and you walk you find them always in the terrace which is not the oregano kind of leaf they are more pointy and more dark some people don't recognize it as za'atar because it's not the common thing you buy in the nursery. So yeah, I would imagine my land with a spot of all these wild things where they grow by their own. I just tame it a bit here and there. Even wild trees and so on that we can uh, take a lot of benefit of like kharoub uh, which grows really huge and old and, and can give you a lot of shade and gives you the molasses and even the wheat we want kharoub, you know, kerob in, in English which is also full of nutrition. The bottom which you can graft pistachio on pistachio palestinian and then you can graft pistachia china on it which is the pistachio we know of course saying local in palestine you can't include everything because it's a mosaic of lots of weather from jericho which is really low and uh, can be really warm in the desert to the area of jaffa where we know all the citruses and then uh, to here in uh, jerusalem and bethlehem which is a bit high to ramallah which is even higher and so on so every area has its unique to to, to you know if we extend a bit ourselves to near Syria, which is uh, julan where you find all the apples and so on which can't grow in in somewhere else like Jericho and so on so we can have in Palestine a local in the sense of very local here and there so you can't say this what I'm saying about uh, applies to everywhere mm. but this can be something to somebody who want to live uh, ecologically and self-sufficient but we can also have all the plants that came across the centuries to Palestine because we are so lucky we are we have a climate that can accommodate so much from all around the world you know if you think about it before airplanes and boats we were the only crossing between three continents before the new world which is America Europe, Asia, and Africa had Palestine as the place to pass from. So, the bridge. <laughs> the bridge. So lots of things were brought here, including plants. So native is not something we can talk about in Palestine. We are so diverse. Also look at my face and look the face of a lot of other Palestinians. We are from white, red, colored, black. We are all Palestinians. Because everybody passed here and this is and also all the religions. So our plants are the same and our gardens are the same. Yeah. Maybe you can say a few things more about the challenges that you have here and that are very particular for the kind of work that you do. For example, water. I was studying the other day about hydrology for my new course, and it made it sound like there is and it's true, there is enough water, there's enough rainfall, there are aquifers, there is also a lot of desalination uh, projects going on. But most of the water in this country goes right to the Israelis and to the settlements, which means that for the Palestinians, there's not much water left 
to deal with. Mm. So in your work, I mean, in agriculture, you need water. What can you do if you don't have enough of that? Mm. Beautiful. So as I, as I mentioned from the book in the beginning, there is all the ways to deal with it. I went one time to Al Walaji near, uh, sorry, to um, near Jericho. What's the name of the village there? Al Auja. They were banana farmers there, but they had ponds like big uh, water reservoirs, and they dried out because the water that comes to these big um, uh, ponds was cut underground by the Israeli uh, management. So now they are challenged. And I was asked, can we do it again? And from the knowledge I have exposed to and saw the examples of, yes, we can do. If we learn how nature saves water, we can manage it in this way. And there's many, 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 many methods that actually farmers around the the world found out. Starting with the simplest and the cheapest is building soil structure. Soil under our feet can be dead or alive. That's why the Americans call it dirt. Because when it's dead, it's dirt, not soil. And what living soil means is soil bumping with life. Which means if you take one gram of good soil, you have zillions of life. From fungi to bacteria, to actinomites, to everything you think about. And these create something together called humus, not hummus. (laughs) 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 Humus. And humus is the the structure of the soil that can hold water in it instead of water dropping on the soil and just seeping into the ground to the underground it stays into the 30 centimeter surface and that you build by imitating nature imitating a forest you go to a forest you don't see the soil why every leaf that drops by every branch stays there and that protects the soil just like clothes protects our skin but now we cut this circle we cut the circle of soil a leave and the branch and then fall down and de- decompose and go back to the tree and so on. So that's why our soil is going dead, getting sterilized by the UV in the sun, getting digged by big machinery, uh, bringing all the life inside to the UV of the sun. And, and we made researches on this and it was proved like mm-hmm. I'm not talking out of theory. We did it here in, by, in the land of a farmer. And we showed that the humidity stays more when we do this and that, which is imitating nature. What we did is not plow the land, covered it with shaved branches and leaves. We left it and we measured the humidity here and in the exposed land. And the humidity stayed until the beginning of the winter. It was there and it disappeared in April in the exposed land. So April and October Imagine six months of humidity stayed in the soil because we covered it. And then there is more worms, more humus, more life, more success, more, how you say, uh, when the body protects itself, uh, immunity, more immunity in the plant and so on. So this is one thing called mulch in English, which means in Arabic, mihad, covering the soil, soil cover. Of course, this will decompose and make composting and composting builds the soil and then it can hold. Other techniques that we a bit more work with is reshaping the soil. So our country is all hills and it's very little flat. Not like Holland. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> you you built the dams yeah. and the dikes. Yeah. Dams and the dikes. That's exactly shaping the land in a way that will works for you we made terraces but there is lots more to do with because now terrace is very expensive to make you can do with just shaping the soil itself without buying it or building it shaping the soil on the hill in a way that works for water to stay as long as possible on your land moving and going and coming back in a zigzag in a snake just sitting and seeping All that changes your land to the point where springs will start springing at the bottom of your land. 
and that all proved and done in Portugal, in Spain, in Greece, in America, California, which is like our our climate. It's all proved and done, just shaping the soil, digging it and putting it like little hills here and there. There's many names for it, of course, you can find in the books I mentioned in the beginning. So yeah, these are a few of the things you can do. The planning for this is also simple to use. I teach in my, my courses, you know, soil harvesting. All these are techniques with small tools you can you make yourself. Mm. Uh, but you need the open-mindedness to say, I'm going to try this on a very small spot, see if it works, and then go for it. This mm -hmm. is what happens with that farmer here nearby. He said, we, we try it on three grape vines, and then he wants to make the whole land is the same. Few dunums. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Before we finish our talk, I want to refer back to the very, very first episode I did for Stories from Palestine podcast, and I talked to Vivian Sansur mm. about the heirloom seed library. For people who forgot, because that's two and a half years ago, or for people who have never heard about that, can you explain what the heirloom seeds are and how important those are mm. in farming here? Mm. That actually connects us to the question before, because heirloom seeds, these are seeds that are kind of trained by farmers to be seeds for this country or for even, I would say, this garden. Because a seed is a living thing and you can train it. Not even the word training, the word uh, raising, uh, nurturing, raising, reshaping, like you, you raise a kid. And the bile seeds, which they call them here, and I would, would not explain that, I will tease you and say, go to that podcast and, 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 <laughs> and hear what uh, the explanation for that there from Vivian, the amazing. These seeds, can live on the last rain and from there continue their life without me bringing them supplemental water. And that's something that the farmers year after year train their seeds to manage, to know. You have this water, deal with it. Make deeper roots, make yourself more resistant, uh, need less water, make your uh, fruits uh, smaller and more condensed, stuff like that. So why I say it's connected to, to water uh, management? Because, yeah, they knew we have a country where we need to plant this food without bringing any additional water for the coming months. So we want this plant to work out for us. So they trained it slowly, slowly, to be something that knows the water inside the soil after the last rain is the last thing you will have. Deal with it. And uh, we we taste from these plants the most beautiful, tasty food that now we all long for. Because even, you know, nowadays, if a company wants to make essential oil from a medicinal plant, They don't indulge the plant. They don't give it the best conditions. To the opposite. They grow it to the point where it's on the edge because then it works very hard to condense all these oils in it. And then when you make the essential oil, you get from the sage and from that lavender more oil than from an indulged oil, you know. Uh, uh, it became lazy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And empty. Yeah. yeah. I feel that I hear through your story something about connection to the land and to the earth is so important. And that as a Palestinian, a lot of people have lost that connection maybe through the last decades of the reality of living under military occupation, colonization, not being able to reach your land, not having the freedom of movement to go wherever you want and people who've ended up in refugee camps and were literally disconnected mm. from their land. Mm. And by doing what you're doing is giving people the opportunity and ability to even in small patches of land to be active mm. with nature mm. and to realize how important it is because without our connection to nature, there is nothing left, mm. right? Mm. So... To finalize this episode, what is your main message, or you can have also more messages with the work you're doing for the people around you, for the people that are listening to this podcast also? 
Thank you for this question. I think this is uh, this is really important. I come to think across the years what's really what I'm really doing, why it's important, and what's really going on. A lot of people, when they work with nature, they talk about save the planet, and I don't think of my work as that because you know now science shows that if we leave this planet to itself, it will fix itself completely. So we're only trying not to ruin our experience on this planet which means not to get extinct or to live in a a bad way you know they talk about climate change and in 2050 we will not have ice in the poles which means this planet will uh, have the temperature rising like four degrees and then we will all have all kind of troubles big cities like new york hong kong will be all flooded uh, holland so on and so on So we're only saving ourselves because the planet will deal with it, you know, even with our own garbage because it came out of it. Even if it will take 15 million years to dissolve some foam there and some plastic here. So I ask myself, why we destroy our own home if we rely on this as a clever creature with a cortex on top of our brain? And I come to the point where I don't want to say we are greedy and all these negative things. We are just not conscious. Because we kind of all destroy nature every day, but we don't want that. Nobody wakes up in the morning. Now, like really, I ask my students, anybody who wakes up and says, I want to destroy nature today, raise their hand. You don't find anybody, unless somebody wants to be like really teasing in the class. (laughs) There's always those. (laughs) But we don't want. I tell them, when you go and grill, where you go and do it in the forest, you go to the beach side. We always go to nature to have the best times. So we all love nature. And if we go to the root of the problem, and that's what my, my mind always searched for since I was a kid, and that's what permaculture always digs for as a planning tool, not a farming tool, by the way, as a planning tool. What is the root? And the root is the lack of consciousness. So my message would say we need to raise consciousness, all of us, in our own self and in others if we got the opportunity, if we are teachers in schools, in kids, if we are parents in our kids as well, if we are, uh, if we are singers where uh, people follow us, then let's do some fun songs in local languages uh, that brings people together. Like I, I watched once a permaculture movie from the 80s where some uh, guys in Africa learned about composting and they were doing compost and with with what they learned they made an African amazing song while working the compost you think this is an old traditional African song and I was like I want to do I want to hear this every time I make compost and this is way more important than when I what I do a song from a pop singer about nature like here we have Tut Ard here in Palestine guys that I never talked to but I really like their words in in Al Julan they talk about nature I love that but they also talk about my main point here which is consciousness and they talk about raising consciousness in all of us why you throw the garbage on the ground but don't do it in a way to blame no just like bring it more close to this person like let let them see what will happen with this bag and where it will reach and what 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 will it will harm and stuff like that so i would surprise you but i would say that after i realized this i also got to the point where healing and therapy is a big part of working with sustainability not gardening not farming not uh, dry compost and dry toilets and uh, geodomes and public Ponics. spaces and aquaponics <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, recycling and all that, which is beautiful. Healing wounded soil, and we have a lot of those in this country, is way, way important because then this person alone, by being healed, will have more sensitivity in all their actions to everything they they do and that's what happened to me towards other people and towards also all the planet Mm -hmm. when i thought about nature i was also an extremist you know when i learned permaculture i was like bad people is city people 
good people are nature people and farmers but then when i i grew in consciousness i realized even that is a duality is a division everybody is good a city boy that never farmed and made a good song or a mid good art that brought people closer to themselves or to nature is very important just like a good farmer so yeah that's my message thank you very much for your time hamed i'm going to add a link to the show notes of this podcast so that people can go and check a little bit more on your website about what you're doing. And if you have any other links and book titles you want to share with me after we finish the interview, then please let me know and I'll add them also for people who want to dive more into this. And I wish you a lot of luck with everything that you are doing. I want to thank you a lot. I think what you're doing with these podcasts are really, really, really important. Thank you. All the best to everybody. And that's the end of this week's episode. Thank you for listening. You know, producing this podcast takes a lot of time and there are also costs for hosting the podcast, for the website and some of the subscriptions related to online recording and editing. So if you enjoy listening to Stories from Palestine, which is available completely for free, then you can do a donation on the Kofi platform, and that is really very helpful, even if it's just a little contribution. Because if all listeners do that once in a while, then I can continue producing new episodes. It's very easy, just click the link in the show notes right after this message. And I hope you will listen again to the next episode.